Uh, today, we're going to start uh, chapter number two, and the title of this chapter is uh, The Sky. And as we did in chapter number one, we always start with a uh, guide uh, post. And the guide post here reads, the previous chapter took you on a cosmic zoom to explore the universe in space and time. That quick preview only sets the stage for the drama to come. Now it's time to return to Earth and look closely at the sky to understand what you are in the universe. You must know where you are. As you look at the sky, you can answer three essential questions. How do astronomers refer to stars by names and brightness? How does the sky move as Earth moves? How does the sky affect Earth? Answering those questions will tell you a great deal about yourself and your home on the planet Earth. Three additional questions will tell you more about how science works. How do we know what is a scientific model? How do we know what is the difference between a science and pseudo science? Pseudo science, that means Shiva science. How do we know why is evidence critical in science? And in the next chapter, you will study the motion of the moon and discover yet another way uh, that the motion in the sky affect your life on Earth. And I think today is May 25th, 2021. Uh, tomorrow, we basically will encounter supermoon and maybe a total lunar eclipse. So you can basically start watching tonight if you have time, and then you can look tomorrow as well. But that will wait till mm -hmm. chapter number three. But it's a good chance to see this, so it will set the stage when we deal with chapter number uh, three. The outline for this chapter will talk about stars. And then we'll talk about the sky and its motion. And then we'll talk about the cycles of the sun and then astronomical influences on Earth's climate. So we'll start with the uh, first uh, part where we're going to talk about uh, stars. Okay. And we'll start with constellations. Now, in the last lecture, uh, I told you that in our own uh, solar system, uh, we measure the distance to the planets with the astronomical unit. And we said this astronomical unit uh, is 150 million uh, kilometers. And I told you, when you look at the sun, you actually don't see the sun right now. You see the sun 8.3 minutes ago. That means we have to wait for the light to reach us from the sun. And the light is the highest speed that we have in our universe. And I told you uh, it is around uh, 300,000 kilometers per second. It's very high. So when you look at the sun, and the sun is a star, you're not seeing the sun right now. You're basically seeing the sun 8.3 minutes ago. And also when we talked about the moon, we said when you look at the moon, you see the moon 1.3 seconds ago. Now, the stars that you see in the night sky, they're very far away from here. So when you look at them, you don't see them now. I told you that in the last lecture that the closest or the nearest star to the sun is Proxima Centauri. And when you look at that star, you see that star 4.2 years ago. So when you look at the night sky, as we discussed in the last lecture, you actually don't see things in the present. You're seeing them in the past. We have no idea what they are right now. But we'll try to look at it the way the ancient uh, looked at the uh, skies. So uh, they wanted to make sense of what they see in the sky 
and uh, to navigate as well. So during the day, you know that the sun comes from the east and it sets in the west. Around noon time, it will be at the highest point in the sky. This enable uh, you to know directions. You can basically decide where the east is, decide where the uh, west is, where the north, where is the south, and you can navigate during the daytime. Uh, and the stars are there, but you don't see them because the sun is so bright. But during the night time, you need something to guide you as well. And uh, now, during the day, you can only see the sun. Sometimes you see the moon as well. And we'll talk about that in chapter number three. But during the night, you see stars. And it's all over uh, the sky in, in, in different directions. And this is, again, is can be used to tell directions and to tell time. So and during the day, we know what the sun is at the highest point. That's noon time, before noon time, after noon time, sunset, sunrise. We can basically decide on that from the sun. During the night as well, you can basically decide when it's midnight, before midnight, very close to dawn, and so on, by looking at what you see in the sky. And this is when uh, constellations were basically uh, developed. So long time ago, there is something which is... Uh, spectacular to see in the night sky you can see some stars that they basically look very bright it's like pearls in the night sky and long time ago humans uh, made use of this so they used to look at these uh, stars and they tried to connect a shape to them. And they use that as a constellation. That means they can tell direction and they also can tell time during the night and they can also tell seasons because some of these, they appear in certain re seasons and so on. So that serves a purpose. But the way they looked at it in order to memorize them and remember them. They always tried to imagine a shape which they can connect to it. So, for example, if you look at this one here, and uh, because of this tail that you have in the back here, they associated that with what it looks like a scorpion. So, this was known as the Scorpius constellation. And it can basically uh, you be used to tell directions and to tell time during the night. Remember, and we'll talk about that, the Earth revolves around the sun once a year and it rotates around its axis once a day. So during the day, you see the sun moving. Actually, the sun is not doing that relative to us. We are the one who, or, or the Earth basically, does that because it's rotating. And that's why you see the motion of the sun and we can tell time. And of course, we have to be careful when we look at the sun to decide on directional zone. The same thing happens at night when you look at the constellation. It may change position during the night because of this rotation of the Earth. And uh, we can tell time. and. Sometimes they appear and disappear during different times of the year, and that's when we can tell seasons as well. So it had a purpose, and that's how the ancients looked at the stars. But they selected the, bright, the brightest stars that they can see in the night sky. And they made stories about that. Okay. 
So they created myths around that because to them, the sky was a big theater. And the players in this theater are the stars. So they start basically imagining heroes and beasts and different things. And they made stories to entertain themselves. And by the way, uh, this stayed with us. Now, when we talk about movies, we say the star. And we talk about uh, a play, we say a star, even in games and so on. That's why we get this word, because stars were the main actors in this uh, myths and mythological stories that the ancient uh, created around the constellations. So a constellation is a group of a bright stars that happen to be in the same general area of the sky. And since these stars are far away, they actually keep uh, with the same group. So during the day, the sun seems to be moving because of the rotation of the Earth. During the night, you can see this group as a whole. It may change location in the sky due to the rotation of the Earth, but it stays as one group. And the reason is these stars are far away from here, and they may not even be uh, close to each other. But they're a projection on the night sky. That's how the ancient uh, looked at them. So they only concentrated on the uh, bright stars uh, that they can see in the night sky. Uh, they seem to be in the same general area. They connect a shape to them. Uh, they can easily follow it. And of course, they created stories. So it, when they look at it, they can remember what it is and so on. Now, in astronomy, nowadays is a little bit different when we look at constellation. The sky itself is divided into uh, into uh, well-defined uh, areas, okay? And these areas, uh, basically, as you can see here, that is regarded as a constellation. So there is a difference. The old way, a constellation is a group of stars that happens to be in the same general area in the sky, and a shape is connected to them, and the, it be, it be used to... Uh, for guidance or directions and so on, and time. <coughs> but now in astronomy, the, the whole sky is divided into well-defined 88 areas. And each area is regarded as a constellation. And uh, a previous constellation may fall into two different uh, regions now. So now, when you look at the night sky, we can say that every star is located in a constellation because it will be located in some region in the night sky. But if we follow the definition of what has been used by the ancient, is basically a constellation is only those bright uh, stars which seem to be in the same general area, and that's what we use as a constellation. Is this clear? Any questions so far onto this? Okay. Now, uh, in here we look at uh, the little dibber and the bigger dibber, and we'll talk about these later. Now, this is the view that you see in the night sky. Okay. It's a projection. But in reality, they are not at the same location. They're further away from each other. But to us, we see the projection of that. We cannot really tell how far they are from here easily. But we see the projection of that. So when you look at constellation, it's not really something which is static and they're all uh, at the same distance from. No, we're actually seeing a projection. And as you can see here, there is something near, there is something further. 
<coughs> and that's how we look at these uh, constellations. Now, there is a famous uh, constellation. It's called the Orion's, uh, Orion constellation. And when you look at the Orion constellation, there are three uh, stars here, which we call the Orion belt. And then there are two bright stars here, one that looks kind of yellowish, the other one will look uh, 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 reddish. So that basically, if you look at it, this could be the shape that you connect to the, uh, to this, okay, uh, Orion, okay, constellation. And that's something that we can see in the uh, night sky. Uh, so um, this is uh, basically uh, the uh, constellation. Okay. Now here, that's uh, another way of these stars here. They are further away from here. They are not at the same location. But at our night sky, we basically, we see this projection here. And that's basically the belt of Orion and you see the different uh, stars there. And maybe later on we'll see if we can spot them in the night sky and we can try to assign something to you to do. So that's how we look at constellation. But again, I have to remind you, nowadays, the sky is divided into very well-defined 88 areas. And each area is, or each region is regarded as a constellation. But the way we still look at constellation is these groups of bright stars. And names are given to them. So now, when you have a uh, constellation, and you try... Uh, to orient yourself. So how can I uh, know that I am looking at it in the right direction? Which means you really have to look at different stars within the constellation. So how can you differentiate between these different stars? And long time ago, there is no way, and it's still even now, it's harder to tell which one is further and which one is closer. So that's something hard uh, to tell. But we can look at the brightness. There is one which seems to be brighter, then there is another one which is less brighter and less brighter, and so on. So within a constellation, uh, they start basically classifying stars based on their brightness. So, for example, if this is the Orion uh, constellation, so that's basically the, the belt of Orion where you see these three stars. Then uh, you look at this one here, and this seems to be the brightest. Then this is the second brightest. So they used a classification within the same constellation where we use uh, alpha, beta, gamma. No, not necessarily. The brighter stars could be further, but it could be more brighter. And we'll talk about that in chapter number nine because it might be a bigger star and it producing lots of energy. So we have to be careful with that. But long time ago, they have no ways uh, of knowing this. So now we look just at the obvious thing that can be able to see which one is a brighter star, and they say this is number one, so they give it a symbol alpha. The second one is beta. The third one is gamma, and so on. So if we look at the constellation of Orion, which has all of these stars, then the brightest star, it's called alpha, 
orions when we say alpha orions that means the brightest star in the constellation of orion but star is also given name and the name that's given for this one it's known as battle juice okay for this star now the second brightest stars will be known as beta orions and the name here is regal okay so stars could be given names and at the same time they can be assigned alpha or beta or gamma depending on how bright they are within the constellation so you can see here uh, orion written in white and the uh, yellow hair is basically referring to the uh, uh, stars now when you look at the night sky and you see these uh, stars or features in the night sky and when you try to take an image of that the image is not going to be as good as when you see it with your eyes because you, the image always looks smaller it's like taking a photo so you have to be careful with that so that's how stars were uh, classified and looked upon when we basically look at this now when it comes to the uh, constellation of orion as i told you the ancient looked at the sky as a form of entertainment so to them it was a big theater and they created stories so for them to remember and if you look at this uh, mighty uh, hero here and you look at battle juice and you find it it's basically it's at the arm bit of uh, this hero bil arabi sometimes they refer to it as ibt al jabbar because it's located here so this is the way uh, constellation were looked at they created a myth a story a name and the stars were classified based on their brightness of course alpha is the brighter and so on there is a big now uh, debate about battle juice what is it doing right now but remember when you look at these you don't see them right now we're looking them in the we're looking at them in the past maybe 600 years ago so when you look at this constellation you're not seeing the star now maybe you're seeing the star 800 years ago i don't know exactly what it's doing right now and we explained that in the last lecture so these uh, constellations are used as a way that can help you to navigate during the night time it can also help you in telling what time of the night it is and it can tell you what seasons we are in so it it served a purpose i think one of the famous uh, constellation is known as the bigger dibber and the little dibber some places they say uh, okay so things like that and there is something special about this because there is a star here which we call polaris and this star is known as the north star so if you spot this star then this is where the north is and there are other uh, constellations here one of them is the one that i already told you here which is orion and uh, you have the two brightest stars in it, battle juice and regal and there are some uh, maps that you can connect to them to recognize them in the sky so it's uh, i'm not going to ask you what shape uh, this is but you can basically look at these maps and you look at your area and identify some of these uh, constellations but i want you to pay attention to this constellation here which we call 
uh, Lara, and there is a star here which looks bigger, and we say Vega, and we'll talk about this later, and I will tell you uh, what it is. This is Centaurus, and this is Alpha Centauri, and remember when we talked about the closest uh, star to us, which called Proxima, or Proxima Centauri, which is probably close to this. So this is how uh, constellation were looked upon in the night sky. But again, I have to remind you, nowadays in astronomy, we chart the whole night sky into 88 regions, and each region can be regarded as a constellation, and that means every star is located in constellation. But the way the ancient, and it's still accepted when you look at constellation, is basically those bright stars that they seem to be in the same general area in the night sky, and as I told you, during the night they may move as one group, so it can tell you about time, and it can also tell direction exactly in the same way when you look at the sun during the day. And these are present during the day, but you don't see them because of the sun is so bright. So you cannot say that the, there are no, you, it's wrong to say during the day there are no stars in the sky. There are stars in the sky, but because of the brightness of the sun, you don't see them. And of course, at night, they will become clear. So this basically the first uh, part here. Is this clear? Any uh, question on constellation or stars or how we classify stars based on their uh, brightness? Good. So what we're going to uh, look at next, we're going to look at how we view the sky. And obvious, during the day you see the sun moving. Is it the sun that's moving or were you moving? So how we can, can we make sense out of uh, uh, this uh, sky? I think let me just... Uh, Okay, take all of these away. Okay. So now, let me now look at uh, the Earth. You're all familiar that the Earth has a point here, and this is known as the North Pole, and the point here known as the South Pole, so we can call this NP here, which meaning North Pole, and this one here we can look call it as SP, which basically the South Pole. And exactly in the middle here, you have the equator, and the equator coming from equal. That means you're basically dividing this in two more or less equal parts. And the North Pole and the South Pole are connected, but it's known as the Earth's axis of rotation. So the Earth basically rotates around this axis. And that's why we see the sun, because we're rotating. So we, it looks to us that the sun is moving, but actually we're the one who are moving. These are the fixed points that we have here on Earth. North Pole, South Pole, and then the line that connects both of them is the Earth's axis of rotation. When it comes to the sky, okay, where is the sky? Now, I don't want you to make a mistake that most people make, and they think that the atmosphere of the Earth is the sky. The atmosphere of the Earth is not the sky. The atmosphere of the Earth, basically, if you look at the Earth as an apple, the skin of the apple is the atmosphere. Or if you look at it as an orange, the skin of the orange on the top would be basically the atmosphere. So the atmosphere in this uh, uh, schematic that we're, it's part of the Earth here. It's very close. It's part of the globe that you have here on the Earth. So don't confuse the atmosphere of the Earth as being the sky. 
Is this point clear? Now, the atmosphere of the Earth, it does affect things. So the sun, for example, is white. If you go outside of the atmosphere, it looks white. But the atmosphere of the Earth, because it has some gases and so on, it makes the sun look uh, yellow to us. That's the effect that coming from the atmosphere. Now, during the day, we see the sky blue. And that's, again, coming from the effect of the atmosphere because light scatters off the atmosphere of the Earth. During the uh, sunset, you can see reddish things, okay? And that's also due to the uh, effect of the atmosphere. But the atmosphere is very close to the Earth, and it's not the sky. So when we look at things, we basically see projection of them. So the sky to us is something far away from the Earth. So we have to model that. And we come here with something that we call the celestial sphere. And you know what a sphere is? Because a sphere is like a ball. So we regard the Earth as a sphere. So we're going to regard the uh, uh, sky as a huge sphere. And at the center of the sphere, you have the Earth. Where is the limit? We don't know the limit, but that's a model now. We're introducing this model. Celestial sphere, you can regard it in Arabic as And the Earth should be at the center of that with its atmosphere. Now, because we see things on the sky, so we have to locate them on the sky. So we do things relative to this celestial sphere. So on this celestial sphere as well, we're going to assign special points. And we're going to use the same points that we have here on the surface of the Earth. But on the uh, celestial sphere, exactly on top of the North Pole, we will have a North Pole, but we'll add the word celestial so we call this north celestial pole or sometimes they say ncp okay and that's the north uh, celestial pole it's exactly on top of the north pole and then on top of the south pole again we have the south celestial pole or scp and on top of the equator, we have a line that basically also cut this celestial sphere in half, and we call this the celestial equator, or we can call it CE. So on the Earth, you have the fixed points, North Pole, South Pole, and the line that connects both of these is basically uh, the axis around which the Earth is rotating around itself. And more or less in the middle, we have a line that we call what we call the equator. Now, the celestial sphere, which a model, we imagine a much bigger sphere where the Earth is at the center of that. And again, there are fixed points on this sphere, which is North Pole and South Pole, but we call it North Celestial Pole. South Celestial Pole and on top of the celestial, uh, on top of the equator, we have what we call the uh, celestial equator. So you have to be uh, careful with with this. Now, since the Earth is regarded as a sphere, and the celestial sphere is regarded as a sphere, half of the sphere we call it hemisphere. So on the Earth, this part here, we call it the northern hemisphere. And this part here, we call it the southern hemisphere. So we say the equator bisects the Earth into a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere. The same thing happens for the celestial equator. It cuts the sphere into 
northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere and of course this would become important because when you look at the sky it depends where you are if someone is in the southern hemisphere we'll see things that are different than those who are in the northern hemisphere so we have to make sense of that is this clear before i move on any questions on uh, on this so that's now basically how we regard the uh, sphere now it comes to you as an observer if you are an observer you basically uh, is on the surface of the earth and you look up at the sky now wherever you're located okay there will be a, a, a circle perpendicular to you which will cut the sphere into half for you so for example if you look at the lady that we have here this lady here will have a uh, something like this which will cut the sphere into half and we call this the horizon of the lady so this lady will see all of this and we say that this is basically the uh, horizon of this lady so she will cut wherever you are as an observer you should be perpendicular to this and you see half uh, the same thing happened for the man here the man is here so this will be the horizon for the man so the man will see this whole uh, hemisphere he will see half of this and this will be the horizon for the man so the man and the woman are at different locations on the surface of the earth uh, the lady can see uh, things in the night sky that the man cannot see the man can see things on the night sky that the woman cannot see but they actually can see common things between them as well depending on your location so depending on your location you will cut the sphere into two halves so now remember what when, when we said about the celestial equator we said the celestial equator will cut the sphere into a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere now your location on the earth you have a horizon which will cut the sphere in again to a half for you and you're only seeing that half now how much of this half is northern hemisphere and how much of it is southern hemisphere that of course will be depending on your location so wherever you are you will have this horizon now we will define points here we which call uh, zenith and nadir zenith is the point exactly on top of your head and nadir is the one that basically below your feet so the zenith point is not fixed point on the uh, celestial sphere it depends on the location so for example the zenith for the man will be here and the zenith for the woman will be here because that's the point will be exactly on top of your head and you may actually hear this word when they talk about zenith and when they talk about horizon we'll try to make these points clear but remember this is not a fixed point on the uh, sphere it's only fixed point at that location that's the point exactly on top so uh, we in this case here any observer is not going to see the whole sphere it's only going to see half of the sphere and of course 
uh, that's their horizon, which will cut the sphere into half. And the point on top is the zenith. The point below is nadir. Of course, they're not going to look at anything uh, on the nadir. They're only looking at in their half here. Is this point clear? So now, when you look at any location, so I want you, I want to orient you here. Uh, this point here is the North Pole. This point here is the South Pole. This is the axis of rotation. On top of it will be the North Celestial Pole. Here will be the South Celestial Pole. And exactly in the middle, you will have the equator and have you uh, here, you have the celestial equator and observer is located here. We kind of tilted this image to show you the observer upside down. Okay. That's not the reality. It might be this way. It might be the earth is here and the observer is here, but we tilted it in such a way that the observer is like this. So I just want you not to be not to get confused with what you have here. It's the same thing. So the observer here will cut the whole sphere or celestial sphere or Qubba Samawiyya into a half. And this is what we call the horizon for him. And in this horizon here, he will have a point on top of his head, which we call the zenith. Of course, below there, it's called the nadir. Now, you're all uh, familiar with when you look at the uh, Earth. The equator is here. Then you have something that cuts this exactly in half. And you have here lines that go this way and lines that go this way and lines that go this way. And this is what we call the altitude and latitudes. Okay. And this is khutut al-tul khutut al -ard. That's how you identify yourself here or your location on the surface of the earth. When we look at the sky, we also want to do that. So we have to look at this directions. And since we fix the North Celestial Pole on top of the North Pole, then we have to locate that North. So on your horizon, wherever you're located on the surface of the Earth, you do not have a choice in choosing your directions. Well, the North on uh, your uh, location, it has to be on line with the North Pole. So what we basically look at the horizon, we'll try to look at the North Celestial Pole. And below that, exactly on the horizon, that's where the North is. And if you look at the North, opposite to it will be what will be South. And then you can decide on the West and you can decide on the East. So, for example, if uh, you uh, look uh, uh, north, the east will be in front of you. So, if you basically uh, uh, stand and put the east at your right hand and west on your left hand, North will be in front of you. Now, if you do that here and you want to look at the north, then the east will be at in this direction and west will be into this direction here. So you don't have a choice to decide where the north is. No, it is decided by that it, the north has to go with the North Pole that you have, and the way you do that, you can locate where the North Celestial Pole is, then this will be the North and your horizon, and we have something that we call 
the latitude and you measure the angle between the uh, north celestial pole and the north and your horizon. So to sum this, uh, we imagine the Earth at the center of a very big sphere. And I told you the atmosphere of the Earth, is not the sky. It has effects, but it's not the sky. Now on the Earth, you have North Pole, South Pole, exactly in the middle, you have an equator. That big uh, celestial sphere, which is Qubba Samawiya, also has fixed points, which is North Celestial Pole on top of the North Pole, South Celestial Pole, which is on top of the South Pole, and on top of the equator, you have the Celestial Equator. And that cuts the Celestial Equator, uh, the Celestial Sphere, into a Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. Any observer on the surface of the Earth will have a horizon. Ufuk. And this horizon will cut the celestial sphere in half. Now, the point exactly on top of the head of the observer is called zenith. The point on top, uh, below at his feet, we call it the nadir. But now, uh, as you can see in the cartoon that we have here. Now, the this whole part here is northern hemisphere. And this whole part here is southern hemisphere. But if you look at this observer, he only sees that much from the south and he see that much from the north. So we have to decide which part of the sky is the observer is seeing or what you can see at your location. Are these points clear? Before we move on, I did too much drawing, but maybe it's, is it clear? Okay. So that's something that you uh, have to pay close attention to. So we'll come here and in this, uh, So in this uh, slide here, uh, just a different way of looking at that. So you can see that we have here the North Celestial Pole. Here we have the South Celestial Pole. That means the axis of rotation. And this is where you have the Celestial Equator. So from here to here, is the uh, northern hemisphere and from here to here is the uh, southern uh, hemisphere now what you see here this is the celestial equator that cuts in half now what you see here that's the horizon okay and you do not have a choice in that horizon so if you look at the horizon here, it tells you that you're seeing that much from the southern hemisphere, and you're seeing from here to here, and that's how much you're seeing from the uh, uh, northern hemisphere. So location now will dictate how much you see and your horizon. And I told you on the horizon, if you locate the North Celestial Pole, that's exactly where your North is going to be. And of course, you have the North, then you will see where the South is, then you'll have the West, and then you'll have the East. And that's how you uh, orient yourself relative to the night sky. So things have to be relative to your horizon, your ufuk. Now, how do we look uh, at things in the night sky. Now, as I told you, stars 
moon, the sun, they're far away from here. And we only look at their projection in the night sky. So relative to us, we don't know exactly how far they are. But what we can do is relative to our horizon, what, <coughs> what angle do they make relative to us? So we measure things here in something that we call uh, angles or mm -hmm. angular distances. So we will look at uh, this angular distance here where we measure it. So we're measuring angles here. You know, when you go a full circle, you have a 360 degrees. And when the circle becomes very huge, one degree can be regarded as 60 minutes. And one minute can be regarded as six seconds. So when things become far away, you can measure them precisely even to the second. Becomes very accurate when you measure these uh, angles. And I think you're all familiar with the GPS. If you have a GPS and you want to put your coordinates, sometimes you put them even in terms of second as well. You have a degree and you have a minute, which is just one prime, and then you have double prime, which is also a second. And if you put that, basically, uh, you can navigate to the location that you want to go to. So uh, this is what we say are two important points, the location of the celestial sphere north or south on the depends upon your location of the observer on the earth the altitude of the celestial uh, pole equals the latitude of the observer and we'll explain that so we want you we want to measure how high is the north celestial pole above your horizon and as you recall from the previous uh, slide how high it is, it will basically dictate how much you see from the southern and how much you see from the northern hemisphere. So that's why we say that this is important here. And then uh, all celestial objects like stars, sun, moon, and planets uh, have orbits on the celestial sphere parallel to the celestial equator. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, let me take this out so we'll make things uh, clear. So now your location relative to the sky is measured with the latitude L. So you have to say at what latitude you are or the observer is. And I told you, you don't have a choice in choosing the north. The north has to be underneath the north celestial pole. And the angle between the north celestial pole and the North Pole, this is basically your latitude. So for example, Al Ain here is located at latitude 24 degrees, meaning the North Celestial Pole is 24 degrees above our horizon. So that's one point that you have to keep in mind. You have to basically decide on your latitude. Now, once you decide on your latitude, now you want to decide when you look at the sky, how much you are basically seeing from the sky. Now, when you look at the sky, the whole uh, celestial sphere is 360 degrees. But any observer doesn't see that, only sees half of that which is 180 degrees. So how many, how much of these 180 degrees is in the 
northern sky and how much of it is in the southern sky. Now we have a rule here. And the rule here says that uh, you see in total 180 degrees. But if you are in the northern sky, that means we are in the northern hemisphere here, you will see 90 minus L from the southern hemisphere. And the rest will be from the uh, northern hemisphere. So how did we basically arrive at this? Now, if you take from here all the way to here. Now, if you take all of this, this will be 180 degrees. Now, if you draw a line, which is basically uh, perpendicular here along the celestial equator, now this will give you a 90 degrees here. And this is L. So I can call this angle here, let me call it theta. So I would, what I will say here, I will say that L plus 90 degrees, which is this angle here, plus theta will give me 180 degrees. So now if I want to get theta, I have to take these to the other side here. So I can put here minus uh, 90 degrees minus L and I can eliminate these from here. So theta here will equal to 180 minus 90 minus L. 180 minus L will give me 90. So this angle here is equal to 90 minus L. Just the simple argument here to show you why we say that you only can see about uh, uh, 90 minus L from the southern hemisphere. Is this point clear? So whenever you know your latitude, 90 minus L, which is your latitude, will tell you how much you see from the southern hemisphere. That of the 180 degrees will be where will be from the uh, northern hemisphere. So, for example, let me uh, look at El uh, Ain. El Ain, for example, is located at latitude 24 degrees. That's your uh, latitude here. That means if you look at the north celestial pole and you look at the north of your horizon, this angle here is 24 degrees. Now the rule says 90 minus L. So if you take 90 minus 24, it will give you 66 degrees. So you will see 66 degrees of the southern hemisphere. In total, you see 180. And of course, from the northern hemisphere, it will be 180 minus 66, which will be 100. Uh, 114 degrees. So uh, you will be basically uh, from Al Ain here, you will see 66 degrees of the southern hemisphere and you see 114 degrees of the northern hemisphere. So 
someone else located let's say at a different latitude let's say let's say take 30 for example well 90 minus 30 will be 60 so they will see 60 degrees from the southern hemisphere so they're seeing less seeing less than you you're seeing 66 and of course the remainder from the 180 will be 180 minus 60 will be 20 and they see more from the northern hemisphere so depending on your location it dictates what you're going to see in the night sky are these points clear are these points clear now if you want to look at the night sky and you want to decide on your latitude you can do it by the way roughly speaking all you have to do is you have to find out where the north star is which is polaris and that exists in the uh, dibber you have to find where the little dibber is and then you can find the uh, north star and then you know what the north is and your horizon and then you can measure your latitude and once you measure your latitude you can basically tell what you see in the night sky so that's basically the uh, bigger dibber and the little dibber and that's polaris and if you spot that that means you're very close to the north celestial pole and if you're very close to the north celestial pole then you can basically decide on your latitude now can you measure your uh, latitude if you do not have any uh, uh, tools you can use your body parts to do that okay and what you do is uh, and i advise you to do it with your hands but this is an average hand if you open your hand this way that will give you about 18 degrees so for example if you have this is your horizon and this is where the object and you put your let's say hands this way that's your finger that will give you about 18 uh, degrees uh, a finger will give you about one degree if you make a fist this way and you measure it that will be about 10 uh, degrees and this will be about six this will be about four this will be three that's not fixed for each one okay the these are different depending on uh, different sizes okay but you can do that for your hand but more or less they will be the same so if you spot where polaris is and you set where your uh, horizon is if you can use one fist here that will give you uh, 10 you put another fist on top of that that will give you a 20 and then if you use only this part here you put it on top here and that will be in line with polaris here and that will be your latitude so that's how you measure your latitude so for some who navigate and they find themselves somewhere and they want to know what latitude they are at they can basically use their body uh, parts to decide on on this i think i'm going to stop here and continue from here in the next lecture any questions so far any questions any questions on these